My name is Nana Ifia Insua Boateng. I'm an emergency physician specialist by profession. And I currently am the head of the department of the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, Ridge Accra. I'm so happy to be here to be interviewed by Just for Women Africa. When um, I completed my medical school, I started house job and house job was with internal medicine. And what I realized was there were a lot of, I don't want to say there was no structure, but there were a lot of gaps that needed to be filled. So fortunately, unfortunately, when I completed and I left for the district, which was Edura, I was there when a good friend of mine called me and she was like, small, emergency medicine has started. I was like, where? She was like, oh, Kumasi, Kumasi, and they, had, they, had, they need residents, so come over. And I was like, wow. And emergency medicine puts the acute setting in check. So somebody comes acutely ill, you are able to do something there and then, critically think on your legs, and then get the required management, required treatment for the person. And that is why I really, really, really love emergency medicine. The challenges have been there. As a young doctor, most of the challenges were, it had to do with infrastructure, it had to do with re training resource-wise. But then as time goes on, emergency medicine is picking up. Is emergency medicine just 12 years in Ghana? But then it's picking up and we are able to do things that were not being done initially when we started. Well, um, so my residency was in Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. And because emergency medicine was new, our lecturers all came from Michigan or Utah. So as part of the residency training, there was some part where you'd have to go and do a six-week internship program in either Utah or Michigan. And I was chosen to go to Michigan. And Konfanochi, the residency training was quite intensive. It was really, really intensive because it's a new specialty, new people are training you, people you are not really conversed with. And with the internship in the US, it, it provided the needed exposure, I would say. And one thing I actually really learned there was, so there was this guy who, he was a doctor who was doing an incision and drainage for an abscess. And the way he spoke with the patient, he spoke with the patient to the point that he told her that the anesthesia he's giving her can kill her. And if you know what an incision and drainage is, this is one of the most simplest of the surgeries that can be done on anybody. But he was able to, to communicate effectively with the patient and I was like, I need to brand myself as such. Be able to communicate with my patients to the point that they feel so safe with me that no matter how critically ill they come, they are able to, both patients or patient relatives, they are able to share their stories so that we treat them much better than previous, that was previously done in Ghana. So one of the major gaps that we face as, uh, should I say, as a society is personnel. We don't have the enough personnel, trained personnel to run most of the facilities in Ghana. So if you realize most emergency physicians are situated in the cities, the regions, the uh, regional capitals and stuff. We don't have those people in the hinterlands. And another thing is resource wise. There are lots of resources that we need that um, are not available as per what we need to use to make the work much, 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 much easy. And also another thing is access. Access being in terms of, we have, um, we work along with the paramedics and sometimes they need to go to some place to bring a patient and accessible roads, accessible, like the facility may not be accessible to them to be able to get the person quickly enough to bring to us for us to sort the issue out. So these are some of the gaps that I feel should be worked on. I always say that if somebody wants to go, I don't have a problem because sometimes it's, 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 they say experience is the best teacher. 
but I feel that those of us who have always decided to stay for the motherland should be able to do more trainings, have more um, scope, a wider scope when it comes to setting example as in, you see in Ghana, most people feel that every doctor sees every, every case. So let's say this case is a general surgery case. This case is a pediatric case. In the Ghanaian setting, every doctor is a doctor. So it puts a lot of strain on, on different specialty, different doctors. Because if a patient is coming from home to come and see me and he comes and I say, oh, wait for your doctor they might feel that I am supposed to see because I'm also a doctor. So I feel that with the brain drain and everything, those of us who have decided to stay in Ghana should have a focus where advocacy should be one of the things we do. Advocacy is in why do, you, why do we need to keep working in Ghana? Access as in training programs should be available to us all the time so that we get better. Because I, being somebody who has been able to experience some form of Ghana, some form of somewhere else, has been able to make that decision outright that I do not want to go anywhere. But there are people who don't have that, who have never been anywhere, but have made up their mind that they want to leave. So we should have that thing where we are able to advocate, we are able to train, we are able to make places accessible to other doctors so that when they go, they know that maybe they will make that decision that I want to stay in Ghana and help the motherland or I need to leave and better myself and come back. But it is a mentality thing, honestly. So I, <laughs> I don't know how it would help to... We can stop it. <laughs> In, in the emergency setting, there are, there are several things that we, we do. Critically ill, not too critically ill, and not critical at all. And when the person comes, like let's say like you said, a bad car accident comes, there are people in the car accident who will be very critically ill, and some people who may not even have been scratched, but they all need to be seen. So there's a triage setting. The triage is where the patients are sorted out. And we use the South African triage skill to sort them out. It's a color-coded system where red is very bad and green is okay. So we use the color codes based on the person's vitals and then some things we call discriminators to be able to sort the patients out as per how bad they are. So after that, we send them to the appropriate color-coded areas. And then we have our resuscitation bay, where all the action happens. So some of the time, patient comes really bad, we wheel them straight from maybe the ambulance or the private car that they brought straight into the resus bay. Or maybe if somebody has already been admitted to the emergency and is lying there and then deteriorates, then we send them there. So that is where we do all our CPR. Sometimes we put people on life support. Sometimes we, pe we put people on... Um, medications to help them bring up their BPs or help them wee wee or help them do what we want them to do as per the objective of the patient. So, um, so this platform was formed, the WhatsApp uh, referral platform was formed two, oh, about two and a half years ago. And so when we, I came to Ridge initially, there was this thing where there was a disconnect between various facilities. So you are there and you, you get a call from another facility that maybe I want to make a referral. And then you say, oh, hold on, there's no bed. So wait till, let's say, um, give me two hours and then I'll call you back. But then you call the person back and the person is like, oh, I left the place. I'm not on duty anymore. And I forgot to tell them that I had called earlier. Or you, you, somebody calls you and then you say, there's no bed, hold on. And then immediately the person lets the patient come without informing us. So two and a half years ago, my director and I were sitting and then he's like, why don't we form a WhatsApp platform for referrals? And I was like, I had thought about it. But when I, I spoke with my fellow emergency physicians about it, they were like, we should hold on with it because of uh, uh, client privacy and all those things. I was like, oh, let's start it. And I was happy because somebody in the hire, my director is telling me to start, so I'm sort of covered. So together with the bed manager, we put up, um, uh, we started collecting names of hospitals and groups of people and we put it up together. And now we have over 
little over 800 people on the platform, doctors, nurses, administrators, physician assistants. And what happens is when there's a, they need to have a, get a referral done, they put it on the platform. There are guidelines for that. And when they put it on the platform, the major hospitals, RIDGE, UGMC, um, 37 police hospital, if they have space, they let us have it. And it has really cut down on those unannounced people who come. Some people may come, may need oxygen, but we, we, we may not have a pot available for them. And it has cut down on those things because now we are mostly prepared before the patient gets here. And it has helped in a lot of just send the patient without informing the referral, um, referring the the site who is coming the what is it called the referring facility and the receiving facility so it has helped those of us who are at the receiving end to get information about the patient before the patient arrives and we prepare adequately for them the first thing is support and I, fortunately for me, aside my, my nuclear family, I have an extended family that works a lot. So I have a lot of support from them and then from the kids that too, I have a lot of support. And it helps in so many ways because there are times where you need to work long hours. When this department was being set up, I was doing 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every day, Monday to Friday. And that time I had just had my second born. And I, got, I always used to say, I got to a time he could not even recognize me as his mom because it was his granddad and the nanny who was taking care of him more. Mostly when I leave the house, he's asleep. When I come back, he's still asleep. So I feel that with the support, the community support around you, they say it takes a village to raise somebody. The community support around me helps me. Secondly, balance. Balance between work and home. There are times where this work is so frustrating that if you are not careful, when you get home, you you pour out your frustrations on your your kids and the people who are there with you. But I've been able to sort of balance that out, and it has helped me a lot in separating work from the home. So the the kids don't mostly even know what happens at my workplace here, and it helps me. So one of the advices I can give is where does your passion lie? Most of the time as we are growing, when we are growing up, people, oh this girl, obey a doctor, she'll be a doctor. And sometimes that is not where our passion is. I did emergency medicine because my passion was with the acute setting. But now people follow, follow the crowd. And I feel that when you follow the crowd, it gets to a place where your frustrations get the better of you. And then you are like, why did I even do this? Do that, that. So number one, follow your passion. Secondly, I think you, if you can get somebody who can mentor you, if you feel that emergency medicine is good for you, get someone who can mentor you. If you think entrepreneurship is good for you, get someone who can mentor you. And when the person keeps on mentoring you, it helps you sort of move forward then be innovative and proactive wherever you find yourself use your innovations and your proactiveness to bring and set standards and rules to to maintain a particular structure that will keep whatever you are doing forever Um, so, um, emergency medicine has moved forward from the time it started and I feel that um, in Ghana, advocacy is what would help move it forward and the future of emergency medicine as it stands in Ghana, it's bright, it's really bright because now everybody Every single person who wants, who becomes a house officer, wants to know something about emergency medicine. They they watch the Grey's Anatomies and those ones, and they are happy that they now can run a code. They now can stay on their own and um, put somebody on life support and all those things. So I feel that the future of emergency medicine is one of the things that will help healthcare go very far, and with the help of. The policy makers with the help of those who are in positions to make changes, emergency medicine will go really, really far.
So emergency medicine is awesome. It is one of the things, one of the places in Ghana that I would assure you as a female, it is one of the places you will enjoy. Because aside being a critical thinker, it also is one of the things, one of the things females we do a lot is multitasking. And emergency medicine is a place where we multitask a lot. So I would encourage every female medical doctor who doesn't know what to do or who already knows what to do to come to emergency medicine course. It will help you build your confidence. It it will help you be one of the best doctors you can be ever in the world and it will let you know that yes you are making a difference in people's lives so i quite remember when i was posted to this hospital rich hospital greater Accra emergency department i called my daddy and i started crying i was like hey they've given me a position as head of department and he knows one of the things i don't like is being a head of department like being in a position and he was like small you can do it so from scratch this thing started small 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 and we built it up and one of the fulfilling moments aside setting up this apartment is we were there one day when a woman brought her husband he had died 30 minutes earlier and she brought him from another hospital that she knows that we wake people up here in our emergency so she's not leaving until we break we we wake her husband up it's it's impossible though and but the the fulfilling moment was the fact that she trusted us enough to bring him from a place where they had declared him dead to bring him here for us to end the 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 testimony she gave was that she, she had brought her husband earlier before um, he was discharged and went home to die and when she brought him there was a guy we saw the guy was virtually dead and we resuscitated him and he came up so to her we are the hospital who bring people up from dead alive from death back to life so she had brought him here and i felt that i was really making a difference with my team because I, it, it's something that was quite phenomenal for me to hear that and she had she stood there we had to call in counselors we had to call in her pastors from places before they had to come to so she left an hour after she brought the husband and i feel that it it meant that we were actually people were trusting us with their lives and i felt really fulfilled with that